The Open Door Baptist Podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5 is where we'll be tonight. And uh, well, Brother Shemish, I hate you stuck your neck out, brother, but uh, so uh, don't hold it against him, all right? It's not his fault. He spoke highly of me. And when I crash and burn, it's completely not his fault, all right? So I don't want you to hold it against him. And I am tremendously nervous, all right? Tremendously nervous. A lot of reasons I'm nervous. First of all, it's a new place. You're always more nervous in a new place. Uh, it's a new state. I've never preached in Washington State. I've, come, I've changed to the airport planes two or three times, but that's it. Never been outside of the airport. So brand new state, a whole bunch of new people. Saw a couple of people know. Good to see Brother Gonderman. I know him a little bit. Brother Shemish and Joe. We had a wonderful experience with Joe. One of the first times I met him at a barbecue place with David Gibbs. Brother Joe, do you remember that? That was life changing for you, I bet, wasn't it? If y'all know Brother Gibbs, if you've ever eaten with Brother Gibbs... It's life changing <laughs> and you never forget it. It's been probably 10 years or so and it's still one of my favorite stories of all times. So maybe we'll tell it to you later, but nervous coming into a new place. Nervous, I grew up in Kentucky. That's about what happens everywhere I go. When I say I grew up in Kentucky, there's nobody here from Kentucky. Anybody ever accidentally go to Kentucky? Okay, well, praise the Lord. Got out of there as fast as you could, right? You was worried. Now, I appreciate the good song here a while ago. I felt a little bit, all we needed was a banjo in there. If we'd had a banjo, I might would have got loose in here, praise God. Scared some of you. And then, uh, so nervous coming into a new place in a big city. And I grew up in Kentucky in a little town. Now, I live now for 20 years in Marion, North Carolina, a little town at the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And so I'm a country boy from the beginning and still a country boy today. So you get in the big city, you get nervous. And I know that I'm in, uh, you know, Bible scholar land, which I'm not that either. I mean, on the way here, Brother uh, Mason was talking about, we were just I was asking him this, that, and the other, and he started talking about, uh, getting his doctorate and working on it and, you know, having to write his thesis, which would be a book and that the pastor has written a book and a half and Dr. Brother Kurt's written like eight books. And I started thinking, man, I don't know if I've read eight books. <laughs> and I'm certain I hadn't read Dr. Kurt's books, but I might can start. I'm just getting a Jeremiah one, right? Obviously, I'm going to get it. Is there money in his book? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll just put some of my own money back in his book. That's a really good reading motivation. I'll put my, my own money in there, but I'll forget by the time I get to it, because it'll take me forever to read it, that uh, I put it in there and I'll just be excited. I'll thank you over and over for money I gave myself. Won't that be good? <laughs> so I come in and uh, we, we got the hotel changed, came on over and uh, trying to, you know, trying to calm down and got in meeting people and shaking hands. And, and a brother walked up to me and said, Brother Tom Gonderman which is not me, just so you know. He's right there. I didn't know I was nearly so good looking, praise God. Uh, I said, no, I, I'm not Tom Gonderman, Tony Shirley. He goes, oh, and he turned and walked off. So, <laughs> so you know, that really, you might want to work on you making your people feel welcome there, brother. Uh, so you pray for me. After all of that, I came in and sit down and the choir was up here singing. And if you'll look over here, if everybody will look over here to this section, I spoke to Brother Shemish and I came on up. I was wanting to sit up near the front and uh, when I sat down, I looked and there, it was two rows of, it was ladies. It was all girls. I said, oh, I've sat on the girl side. I didn't, <laughs> there was no usher that told me there was a girl side and here I am, the only guy on the girl side. But they told me that wasn't the case and then I noticed some others. So praise the Lord. Mark chapter five, verse 22. Somebody's preaching after me. Who's preaching after me, brother? Fisher. Brother Fisher will be preaching after me. That's another reason it makes you nervous. <laughs> hey man, I'm coming to a meeting with Brother Fisher and Brother Shemish. Y'all know them, right? It's like preaching with Master Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi. What? They're in the deep end of the pool. We're going to be over in the other end of the pool, okay? So come over here with me, and then Brother Fisher will take us over there. Is everybody okay with that? We've all got our part to play. 
He's talked about me preaching at Lighthouse for years. And to be honest with you, I still don't know why. I just, uh, the Lord blesses and I get to go and I'm thankful for the opportunity and I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. And what I did learn a long time ago is I can only be what I am and I can be the best I can be. And I should work at that and study and, and train and try to learn. And, uh, you know, but I cannot be these other men. But I am thankful that God can use whoever. He can use whoever and he can use uh, people from anywhere. I guess, can I have one of these waters, brother? Amen. Boy, y'all don't want me to preach long, do you? Look at that. <laughs> I can take a hint. Uh, brother Fisher's coming. If you could just drink a small bottle, that'd be good. <laughs> I'm feeling better, praise God. And so uh, I decided a long time ago that what I could be is just try and be real. And uh, that's the key to all of us is being real in the pulpit, out of the pulpit is try and walk with the Lord and be real and try to please him, try to preach to please him. And that's not as easy as it is said. And we're all flesh. And these men we do highly respect. And, and you know, you, you get in places like this and you want to be a blessing for the preacher and, and uh, you want to, you know, make him look good and all this other stuff. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, when it's said and done, if the Lord is pleased, and that's all that matters. So we'll try and do that tonight. Mark chapter 5, we'll read verse 22 here. And I'll watch the time and try to go quickly so Brother Fisher can come and fix whatever mess that I make here tonight. I do want to be a blessing to you. And I mean that. I want to be a blessing to you. You pastors that are here, we appreciate you making an effort to come. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet, besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. And Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many phys physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for safe traveling today. Thank you for working all the flights out and all those things. I appreciate uh, Brother Murphy Let me have the privilege to come and be in his meeting and be in this pulpit. And Lord, we joked about it, but I do appreciate the great honor to be with Brother Shemish, Brother Fisher, and uh, these other pastors that are here. Lord, I thank you for that. And I'm often amazed that you have uh, given me these opportunities. And I certainly don't feel worthy, but I do thank you. And so, Lord, I want to be used tonight. I want to be filled with your spirit. I want to say only what you'd have me say and not add anything to that. And Lord, I pray most of all that you'd be pleased, but that also you'd use me to help somebody and encourage somebody and bless particularly the preachers and the folks that are here trying to live for you in these crazy last days that we're living in. And I pray that you'd help us now. Bless every heart. Lord, we know the Holy Spirit is the key. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would have nothing in them that would be a hindrance or a grievance to the Holy Ghost. Help us to remove any bitter spirits or angry spirits, things that might have happened today that had us frustrated. Lord, help us to get out anything that might be critical or hateful or judgmental. And Lord, I know we're just knowing each other. And sometimes you, you uh, go through a little period there where you're checking each other out. I pray you remove all of that. And Lord, you just give great liberty to me and great liberty to the hearers. And Lord, use this to be a blessing to your people. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people say it. I want to preach to you for a few minutes tonight on this thought. People have issues. People have issues. I don't know if y'all use that phrase out here the way we do sometimes over there. Have you ever looked at somebody or a situation and you thought to yourself, and you may have even said it, which probably you shouldn't have, but you had the thought, you thought, wow, these folks have issues. Do y'all use that term like that? Where it's something's just a little bit uh, different. You go, whoo, something's going on over there. Some of you thought that immediately when I started speaking up here a while ago. How many of you think you need an interpreter for me tonight? Anybody need an interpreter? All right, I hope we're doing all right on that. 
And uh, that's what I, I was reading through this text some time ago. And that word uh, jumped out at me. And we're King James Bible people. We believe every word's in their own purpose. And so when we see the word issue, the Lord brought. And, you know, it's a good thing about the Bible is you can read it a million times and it's unsearchable. You can just continually dig out new things the Lord will bring out and show you. And it was that word that jumped out at me. People have issues is what I began to think. I heard a story about a fellow that uh, lived across the street from uh, a mental facility, a place where people that had mental problems would live. And uh, he had lived there for many years, never really had much trouble. But one day he came out and uh, as he doing some, uh, actually was going somewhere and came out to his car. And as he was going to his car, he heard across the fence, they had a fence around the facility. He heard on the inside of the fence, a whole bunch of them chanting the number 13. They were just 13, 13, 13, 13. Well, he's heard some strange things from across the fence there. And uh, due to the, you know, the troubles that they have. And so he didn't really think much of it. He got in his car and went on about his business. Came back a couple hours later when he got out of his car to go into the house, had his hands full of his bags and things. They were still doing it. Now it had been a couple hours and they're still going. 13, 13, 13. Now because of the length of time, uh, that one got his attention. He started, I wonder what's going on over there. Well, he just kind of shook it off and went on in the house and went about his business. And now a couple hours after that, he came back outside to do some work in the yard. As he comes back out now, it's been many hours in the day. There's still 13, 13, 13, and his curiosity is getting the best of him, but he tries to ignore it, goes on about the business of working in the yard, and finally, after another hour or so of just hearing that over and over, he couldn't help himself. So he laid down the tools, and he went over to the fence, and he began to go along the fence to find somewhere that he might could look in and figure out what was going on over there. And he found a knot hole. Y'all know what a knot hole is? Raise your hand. A knot hole where it had fell out and you could peek through. And it seemed like it was real loud right there on the other side of the knot hole. So he thought this worked out good. So he leans down and he looks through that hole over there. They're chanting 13, 13. And right when he does, one of them pokes him in the eye. And they all start chanting 14, 14, 14. <laughs> People have issues, amen. Now he's got one. The longer I live and the longer I pastor, the more I realize that in one way or other, we all have. What's the word tonight? We all have. If we were to, how many of you understand tonight that if we were to question the people that know you best, they might tell us you have some. What's the word tonight? How many of you know if we were to question the people that know you best, they might tell us some issues on you? Sure. I have uh, joked with our church for years. I, you know, they have a lot of different diagnoses now that they didn't have. When I grew up, I'm not, you know, too awful old. I'm 42, but I grew up in Kentucky and, and they're about 10 years behind the whole rest of the country. So it seemed like I grew up in a different day. And back when I grew up, they didn't have all the diagnosis they have now. I, I guarantee you that I'm attention deficit. I, I've never been diagnosed, but I promise you I am that, that ADHD, because I am very easily distracted. As, amen. If a squirrel comes through here while I'm preaching, we'll stop and talk about it. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> But they didn't call it that back in the day, Brother Murphy. They didn't say, he's attention deficit and let's take him to the doctor. They just whacked you. <laughs> they used the word hyper. Anybody remember that word? Hey, am it? How many of you, they told you, you were hyper? Raise your hand. And it wasn't no medicine about it. It wasn't, we're going to take him, let him talk to somebody. It was, if you whack him enough times, he'll calm down. <laughs> Isn't that right? I had a slapping mama. Anybody have a slapping mama? I know we're in Seattle or close to it. You don't do that kind of stuff anymore. But in Kentucky, years ago, she didn't know you wasn't supposed to do that. And we didn't even have a telephone. That's the truth. So you couldn't call social services and tell on her <laughs> like you can now. As a matter of fact, if I would have ever said, I've thought about this many times. If I would have ever said, Mom, I'm calling social services to tell on you for how you hit me and all these other things. What she would have said was, if we even had a phone, which we didn't, she would have said, don't bother calling them. Just call the ambulance. <laughs> Because that's what you'll need by the time they get here. And so I never called anybody. I just twitch a lot when, you know, when I get around ladies that look like my mama, I do a lot of that. Praise God. So attention deficit, no doubt. And borderline schizophrenics, what I tell our church. I mean, voices. And I, it's, there's a whole crowd of us up here. And it's, it's, I mean, it's exciting. I'm never alone. I was joking about that sometime at our church, just saying, y'all, and they know I'm wild. They say I'm crazy. They love it. I don't know if it's pity or what, but praise the Lord. One day I'm driving home. My boy was with me in a truck, and he's, uh, at that time he was 10. He said, Dad, have you ever named them voices in your head? <laughs> I looked over at him. I said, uh, no, I don't think so. He said, why don't we call them? And he started, and he decided there were six. I don't know where he got that. He might have talked to six of us. I don't know. He said, let's call him Tony 1, Tony 2, Tony 3. And he called five Tonys. And then he said, Tony 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and Sebastian. 
That's what I did, sister. That face you just made on the back row. That's what I did. I went, who's Sebastian? He said, that's that crazy one, dad. <laughs> so how many understand when you name the voices in your daddy's head, your family has, what's the word? Issues. We have issues. We have issues. That word jumped out at me tonight. Let's look at a couple of things as we think about it. And then we'll get out of the way for Brother Fisher to come and help us tonight. I want you to see, first of all, looking at this lady with the issue of blood, the diversity of her struggles the diversity of her struggles. It commenced in her life with physical issues. Verse 25 again. You've read this. You've heard it preached many times. Let me just show you something tonight I felt like the Lord uh, spoke to my heart about some time ago. Verse 25 says that she had an issue of blood 12 years. Now this is where it all started for this dear lady. But you know, many of us have been in church. I would say the same for you. Many have been in church uh, a long time. And even if you haven't been in church too awful long, if you've just been in church a few years, you've probably heard this story or read this story or at least heard a, a lesson or a message about it or even a song about it. And so we know the end of the story. We know what's going to happen for this lady that has the issue of blood. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a blessing that we read the Bible. It's a blessing that you go to church and that you know the stories of the Bible. Our children are growing up in Sunday school. They have had, you know, pictures. Of, we used to do flannel graphs where you'd take the little man and stick him up on the board and you'd tell the story and it'd have Jesus, it'd have the lady and all these different things. And so they even know, even, even the ones that cannot read the Bible yet for themselves, they probably would tell you that she pressed through the crowd and she touched his robe there and then she got healed. So we know the end from the beginning. And sometimes that works against us a little bit. And I believe really grasping what's going on in the stories of the Bible. And so we read this line and we read that she had an issue of blood 12 years. And I don't think we really uh, grasp the seriousness of her condition because we know she's getting ready to get healed. I mean, think just a minute about a lady who has been losing blood for 12 years without the aid of the modern technological advances that we have today. She was not getting blood transfusions to help her keep her strength. You understand that? For 12 years, she's had this issue of blood and she's lost blood. And then maybe it would get a little bit better for a while. Then it would come back. And I, I don't know if you've visited anybody lately that's been sick with some kind of blood issue. But we have a lady in our church, Miss Kim. It's got cancer. She's been fighting cancer for about two years. And uh, Miss Kim was always... Uh, very fixed up. She sings in our choir and, and she always had her hair just right, always had her makeup just right. And even since she's been sick, I'd go over and visit her at the house and it seemed like uh, no matter how bad she was, she was always fixed up just right. Even as she went through the treatments and her hair fell out, she started getting the wigs, you know, and you really couldn't tell any difference. I couldn't. And, and she just always looked so sharp. And so I come to visit her one day and what had happened was through some complications, she had begun to lose blood and they had to rush her to the hospital and start giving her, uh, you know, some blood transfusions. And when I walked in, I'll be honest with you, I was uh, taken aback at what she looked like. She didn't have enough strength to fix herself up that day and, and uh, she didn't, I, I can't remember, I've seen her so many times now, you pray for her if you think of it, she is in the final days of her life. And so I can't remember if she even had the wig on or off because I've seen her lately with it off. And I just remember walking in and what I couldn't, what I couldn't believe was how much weaker she looked than the last time I saw her. Sure. I mean, she just looked, she's 42, same age as me. And she just looked like if you touched her, she would break that day. And it was because of that lack of blood. She had lost a lot of blood at the house before they ever uh, figured out that, you know, it was so drastic and came to the hospital. When you've been in the hospital as much as she has, you don't want to go back, see? So you wait and you wait and you wait. You don't just rush at the first sign of, well, I'm bleeding a little bit. No, you don't want to go back because you've laid in there. And so she waited and waited and put it off to almost to the point that she didn't make it that time. So when I walked in, you're dealing with a severe loss of blood. And I'll be honest with you, I couldn't believe how pale she looked and how frail she looked, how weak she was. Now, just for a minute, can you imagine 12 years? No transfusions. No modern medicine. I don't think we really uh, stop. I think we, we read over it. We read she had an issue of blood. And even the way the Bible writes it here, it's only a few verses. I mean, just re you read that she was sick right. and you read that she tried everything and grew worse, by the way. Right. So we're seeing her here at her worst. Right. And I, I need you to see the seriousness about how, how, t how weak she would be, how frail she would look, how pale she would look. I don't think there'd be any question that you could pick her out of the crowd. And that she was coming through here with this very serious physical, what's our word tonight? Can you imagine just how tired she was 
And how about how tired of it she was? It all commenced in her life with a physical issue. You know, I, I remember Brother Shemish, and I've used this before, you telling, you got saved at 13, I believe it was, never had been in church much, never had read the Bible stories or heard them. And I remember you talking about riding home on the bicycle. Am I getting that right? Just keep shaking your head yes, because if I'm wrong, I don't want to change it. Or it really works good with my message. So, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I remember you telling us that how you read those stories of Jesus, particularly Lazarus. Is that the one that I remember you telling about? He said that because he'd never grown up in church or in Sunday school or with the Bible, he didn't know the end of the stories. Sure. See, I grew up in church by the grace of God. Thank the Lord for it. So as I said, before I could even read the Bible or before I even wanted to read the Bible, I was having those stories told to me in Sunday school, preached to me from the pulpit. I would hear them in song. And so I know Lazarus comes back from the dead, right? Well, Brother Shemish, I remember him telling that he was riding his bicycle home every day to get home to read the Bible. Yep. And when he was reading the stories of Jesus, he said he did not know how they were going to end. And it just really impressed upon me uh, how sometimes I miss things in the Bible because I know the end. And he said that when he read the story of Lazarus, and so, you know, they come and say, Jesus, your friend is sick and you've got to hurry. And so the Lord's kind of taking his time and the disciples are talking to him. And then in a little bit, Jesus just says, fellas, Lazarus is dead. Now, see, when we read that, it don't bother us because we know what he's getting ready to do. Right. We know that he's getting ready to go do a better miracle than they had ever seen before. And we know that he was doing that on purpose because he was taking a big step toward the cross. That miracle in itself ratcheted up a notch the Pharisees that they had to kill him. But see, I remember Brother Shimmy saying he didn't know how that was going to end up. And if I remember it right, brother, it was almost like you went, <gasps> like it took his breath that Jesus let his friend die. Because see, he didn't know he was going to raise him. Now, me and you have never read the Bible like that, have we? Now, it's not wrong to have been raised in church. It's a good thing. But I think that gives us the understanding of how because we know the end from the beginning, we sometimes miss the severity. You got to understand, it's a pretty big deal that Lazarus died to his family. Because they hadn't read yet that Jesus was coming to raise him. And it's a pretty big deal here that this lady has an issue of blood 12 years. And I believe we ought to try to, with our imagination, see the severity of her weakness, her frailty, uh, her pale look, and, and just what this 12 years would have done in her life. If you got a little glimpse of that in your head, say amen. amen. And so it commenced in her life with physical issues, but I want to submit to you that that created social issues. Now, the Old Testament law was very specific about people that suffered from blood disorders. Just so that we can hurry and get Brother Fisher up here. We're not going to turn there, but you can write it down. In Leviticus 12, 4, it talks about some blood issues. And it talks about a lady. It says that that lady shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary. Listen to that. If she had a blood disorder, she couldn't come into the sanctuary. Not only that, but in Leviticus 15, 19, it says, And whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even. And, and the Bible goes on and tells in other places that if she were to sit in a chair and she had a blood issue and then somebody else come and sit in that chair, now they were unclean. And see, that's another thing that we read and we just read unclean, but we don't understand that that messed up your whole life right. in those days. And so what you need to understand is she's got a physical issue for 12 years. She's been dealing with this, but that's not where it ended. That thing created social issues for her. Sure. You know what we want to do? Even, even the casual Christian, Brother Murphy, when trouble comes into their life, if they know a little bit about God in the Bible, one of the first things they want to do is go to church. They want to go to church and they want to go there and they want to get the preacher and they want to say, preacher, will you pray for me? This has come into our life. And there's nothing wrong with that. We thank God that they can do that. But do you understand that this lady couldn't do that? If she came to the synagogue and maybe knocked on the door and wanted to come in and, and somebody stopped her and said, excuse me, ma'am, can I help you? And, and she began to explain that I have this sickness. I, I have this problem. And I, I'd like for the priest to talk to me. And I'd like for him to touch me or anoint me. or I'd like for him to offer a sacrifice for me. I just want him to ask God to help me. You know what they'd say to her? Ma'am, I'm sorry, you can't come in. Here's these rituals. You got to go through these cleansing rituals and we'll put you away for seven days and, and we'll let you go through this process. And then after seven days, you can come back and we'll see if you get to come in. And do you understand? I don't know how many times she did that, but if she did it every seven days, she's been told no for 12 years. 
So the very place you would want to go with this kind of problem in your life, she's not welcome. The very people you would look to to try to get some help. Listen, she's tried every doctor in the world. In her life, she's tried everything. I would say that people have said to her, hey, try my doctor. Isn't that how it works for us? We try to get help and it don't work out. Somebody says, well, look, I just met a new doctor over here and I really like him. Why don't you go try him? I would say that's what's went on here. The Bible said she had tried many physicians. And so her friends would say, hey, go over here and try this one. and Go over here and try this one. And she's tried all of them. And I'd say in the middle of all that, she'd come to the synagogue and say, could I talk to the priest? I'd say, I'm sorry, ma'am, you can't come. So now she can't go to the synagogue. And by the way, because of those laws of if she touched something, now it's unclean. And if somebody else touched that, they're unclean. She wouldn't be welcome at the marketplace either. You understand that? I mean, if you owned a shop, you wouldn't want her to walk in there because anything she touches is now unclean. And if anybody else comes in and touches that, now they're unclean. You say, what would they have to do? Now they got to go out and go through a bunch of rituals until the afternoon. And then maybe they'd be considered clean. It messes up their whole day, see? So if you owned a market and there was a little bench outside your store, you wouldn't want her to come and sit there. Does everybody understand that? So when they, and by the way, don't you think that after a while you could, you'd get to know her in a little town? And by the way, by her appearance that I described to you earlier, don't you think people would soon figure out, oh, that's the lady that for all these years had the issue of blood? And so if you were running that store, you'd say, ma'am, uh, ma'am, you can't come in here. You can't come in here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Have you been to the priest? Have you been cleansed? Are you still sick? And so for 12 years, you know what it's doing? It's creating her. She's a loner. She's an outcast. Does everybody understand that? Now, what we read was, she had an issue of blood 12 years. And we just read over it because we know she's about to get healed. Hey, but listen, it's been a pretty severe 12 years for this lady. Her physical issues have now created social issues. Now, we don't know whether or not she is married, but what if she was married? What would it have done in their house? 12 years. 12 years, her husband can't touch her. If he does, he's unclean. Hey, listen, think about this. What if she's got children, ladies? The baby's in there crying in the middle of the night. She can't just get up and run in there. If she does and she picks up that child, now what's wrong with the child? The child's unclean. It's got to be ritualized. It's got to be cleansed. I wonder what that felt like to her. I wonder what if she didn't sleep in the same room with her husband. Because if she lays in that bed and then he lays in that bed, he's unclean. Now I understand he might have chose to do it and then went through the rituals himself. That may be fine. But can you understand the burden that puts on her? If he says, honey, I don't care, I don't care, she's still carrying the burden of, he's got to be unclean to just touch me. Lord, why are you doing this? So her physical issues are now creating social issues. She's, she's no longer welcome over at her friend's house. She can't just come over and hang out. She can't just go to the market. She's not even welcome in church. 12 years. You know what? I want to submit to you that the Physical issues and the social issues combined have led to emotional issues. And I think I can show you evidence of that right here. She's living a life of loneliness and seclusion. And it caused in her some emotional issues. Twelve years of this. If you look at it there in verse 27, the Bible said when she heard of Jesus, she came in the press. What's the next word? Behind. Everybody said she came in the press. Behind. Now, why do you think she did that? Why do you think, you remember the blind Bartimaeus on the side of the road? Somebody told him Jesus was coming. He heard it. You know what he started doing? He started hollering out. Jesus, our son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't sneak up behind Jesus. You know, others, uh, as a matter of fact, Jairus in the same chapter. Sounds like Jairus came right up to the Lord and, and, and confronted him and said, and said hey, my little, my little daughter, my little servant, the little girl, she's sick. Would you, would you come? He, he just ran right up to him. But not this lady. This lady comes behind. You say, what do you think? I think she's sneaking. You say, why would she sneak? Because I just told you she's not welcome. It'd be like this multitude right here. And if we were to put the pastor in the middle of it and we're all walking with him somewhere, the, it said the crowd thronged him. It was like a celebrity in a little town walking through town and the crowd's just walking with him and they're all wanting to touch him and everybody's wanting to get up close so they can see him. That's what's going on with the Lord. As a matter of fact, when Jesus says, who touched me, the disciples looked at him like he was crazy and said, Lord, all these people are touching you. Why would you ask who's touching you? So you got to understand something. For her to get to Jesus, she's going to have to go through this crowd 
And what's she going to do even by accident going through that crowd? She's going to be touching all kinds of people, which is against the law, which now is going to bring great wrath on her. So, see, you got to understand, if she would have done like uh, Jairus and said, hey, 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 I want to go up and t talk to Jesus, they would have said, whoa, well, what are you doing here? Be careful, my boy's over here. No, you, no, you can't come here. St stay over there. Go way over there. Don't touch nobody. If she would have said, I'm going to touch him, what do you think they would have said? I mean, to some, he was considered a rabbi. I mean, what, what would they have said if, if she told them her plan? My plan is to come here and go and touch Jesus. Well, they would have said, ma'am, you know the law. You can't touch anybody. It's certainly not a rabbi, a religious leader. You're not, you, you just can't, you're crazy. You've lost your mind. So you know what she does? She's coming up from behind. Because she knows she's not welcome. She knows her plan would not be accepted. So she's sneaking. As a matter of fact, let me show you something. When she touches the Lord and the Lord stops everything and turns around and says, who touched me? What I want to submit to you is that she knew that he knew. In Luke chapter 8, verse 47, you don't have to turn there, you can if you want. Luke 8, 47, here's the way it says it. It says, when the woman saw that she was not hid. So she touches the Lord. The Lord stops everything and wheels around. And he says, who touched me? Now, I believe most of you know the Lord already knew who touched him. How many of you understand that? Say Amen. amen. He's going to teach here. He's going to make a point here. He's got some things to do. But he stops everybody and turns around and says, who touched me? And in Luke 8, it said when he turned around and said that, it said when she knew she was not hid. I think the Lord looked right at her, Brother Gonderman. I think when he turned around and said, who touched me? He looked right at her. Even in our text, it says when she knew it was not hid from him. You know, when she knew the thing was known, what had happened. But here's what I want you to see in this text. When, she, when he asks the question, and she knows that he already knows, and she's getting ready to come and confess, the Bible says she comes fearing and trembling. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't think she was fearing the Lord. She was fearing, I just got busted. How many of you understand that? She, I believe in her heart, preacher, she wanted to slip in with nobody knowing or noticing her, touch the Lord, and get away and see what happened so there'd be no uproar, so nobody would say you're not welcome here, so nobody could deal with her about the fact that she's broken the law. I mean, I, I think she didn't want to risk hearing again you're not welcome as she's heard all these 12 years. And so she's pressed through this crowd, by the way. She understands now that when the Lord draws attention to her and everybody looks at her and some are going to recognize her and the ones that don't even know her personally can see something's wrong with this dear lady. Don't you know she's going to realize they're going to realize she just touched a bunch of them and that they're all going to be mad that she's even there and they're all going to be mad that she just touched them as she crawled through that crowd to get to the Lord. And you can see the anguish, you can see the emotional strain as she comes fearing and trembling to confess what she just did. Do you see a little picture here that it's a little worse in our minds? It ought to be a little worse than it is typically when we read the woman had an issue of blood 12 years. Right. She didn't just have a cold. This woman had a diversity of struggles in her life. It started with the physical. Because of the law, it involved a bunch of social things. And I believe that 12 years of dealing with all the social ramifications of her sickness. And 12, let me just ask you, don't you know there was some times that she sat up by herself and looked toward heaven and thought, why am I going through all this? Don't you know there were times when she was not allowed to go into the synagogue that she would think, God, I don't understand why you're doing this to me and not to everybody else. I, if we were to put our words in her life, I am certain there was probably, I believe right here we see anxiety. That what in modern days they would diagnose this moment that she was having anxiety right there. And I would say certainly there was some depression in those 12 years or at least severe discouragement 
when I couldn't be with my husband, when I couldn't hold my children, when I can't go over to my friend's house and I hear they're all getting together, when I want to go down to the house of God and the priest, I'm not welcome. Hey, when I've tried over and over to get purified and cleansed and every time they test me, they come back. Hey, hey listen, have you ever known anybody that's having medical tests and it just seems like every one of them comes back negative? Everyone comes back bad? Every time they go, it gets worse? You know what that does? It's like waves of an ocean and it just pounds on them and pounds on them and for 12 years she's been getting that for 12 years they've been saying you're still not clean and you're still not clean you're still not clean and I can't imagine the nights that she must have looked up and thought what is going on why am I even alive right. we don't know it and I'm not trying to over dramatize it here but I believe certainly there was times that she wished she wasn't sure sure what I'm trying to show you here is that this lady has a diversity of struggles in her life. She has serious, what's the word tonight? Issues. issues. And so let me just say this. Our churches are full of them. Sure. Right. The pastor stands up here and people come in every week and you don't know them. Some of them we know that you don't know. Some of them none of us know. They're just walking in carrying them. Right. Just walking in. I mean, just... Um, are we live stream? No. Okay. Just this week, uh, great family. Great family. Calls me and says, can we meet? We need to meet with you. I text, sure, how about Wednesday night after church? I said, can you give me a heads up on the topic? And she says, marriage. And it's been, they've been dealing with it. It's, it's as bad as you can imagine. And they've been dealing with it since November and none of us knew. But now it's got so bad they, can't, they felt like they needed to ask somebody. You know what they've been coming in? They've been coming in with, what's our word tonight? Issues. Service after service, carrying it in, not telling nobody. Trying to get it fixed by themselves. Hoping that nobody will find out, that their kids won't find out, that their friends won't find out. And we had no idea. You, I can't imagine the heaviness that she's been carrying in there. And they're like that in here tonight. Some in here tonight, physical issues in your family. Uh, social issues, financial issues. I'm talking about a, a family in my church. They called over to me some, about a year or so ago, and, and it's a young husband and wife. They got several kids, and she's leaving. And she's leaving for a lady. And they got foster kids. They got one that's autistic, and he just don't understand none of it. And brother, every service he goes to the altar. He's probably about 15, 16, and I'll go down there and pray with him and I'll say, hey, buddy, what are we praying about? And he just weeping. He said, I'm praying for my mama. I'm praying for my mama. Now that, see, you, you might have a better understanding than him and maybe you could get over that. But you know what it is in his life? Say the word tonight. It's serious, man. And all I can do for him is I can say, well, let's pray. And for every one of them, there's 10 more. And they're coming in and they're real. And by the way, our teens, they're bringing their own. And we look at them sometimes like, oh, y'all don't know what a real problem is. Hey, but listen, they do. And in their heart, it's every bit as big as ours. And it's every bit as heavy. It's every bit as emotional and straining. It's all that. It's every bit of that. But I want you to see not only the diversity of our struggles, and I've got to finish with this. I want you to see the decision to touch the Savior. Now, unfortunately, it was a delayed decision. Like many of us, it seems that before ever coming to the Lord, she had tried everything this world had to offer. She had literally spent all that she had, spent all of her living, the Gospel of Luke said. Now, to her defense, stay with me now, Jesus was not available when she first got sick. He had only been doing his miracles at this point for about two years, and she's been sick for how long? So for the first 10 years, there was no Jesus running around doing the miracles. He hadn't started his earthly ministry yet. And so she couldn't have run to the Lord. And to her defense again, the Bible said here in verse 27, she, or excuse me, the Bible says there, yeah, in verse 27, when she had heard of Jesus. So it sounds like that when she did hear there was a Jesus, that she tried to get to him as quick as she could. But you know, sometimes we don't and we already know about him. Why is it we try in our own life everything else before we'll bring it to the one who can fix all issues? And you know we do. Men, we're the worst. We're problem solvers. We're fix-its. And so the problem comes and our mind immediately shifts into, here's what we've got to do to fix it. Here's what we've got to do to fix it. 
I mean, I've done that as a pastor. Uh, financial issues come up and immediately I start, well, we'll take a little bit out of the general account and, and we'll, we'll use some out of this account and this, that, and the other. And, and I hadn't even asked the Lord yet. I haven't even said, Lord, uh, do you want to provide some miraculous way? And by the way, sometimes he does. And so we see her decision was delayed. And I want to say two things about that very quickly. One is we already know about Jesus and we ought to come to him first with our own issues. Before we go to even anybody, before you even come to the preacher, you ought to go to the Lord yourself. Aren't you glad we don't have to go to the priest? We can go, hey, we, oh, sorry sinners like us, get to enter boldly into the throne of grace all by ourselves. You don't have to be the high priest. You don't have to be the best preacher in the world. You don't have to do everything just right, cross every T and dot every I the way they did in the Old Testament. No, you can just drop right where you are and walk straight in because, not because I'm any good. Hey, I don't get to go to the throne of grace because I'm a preacher. I don't get to go to the throne of grace because I've been good. I get to go because the blood of Jesus has been applied to my soul. And the blood of Jesus is welcome in the throne of God. And so when I have an issue in my life, when my kids get sick or my wife who's got some physical problems gets worse. You know what I can do? I don't have to go find a priest. I can go right to Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? But often we don't go right to Jesus. But the second application on that thought is there's all kind of people around us that have issues and they don't know Jesus can help them. I wonder why they waited two years to tell him. I wonder why the Christians, I wonder, and you say, well, it's just two years. Hey, listen, if you'd already been sick for 10, two more years is a long time. Don't you know she wishes somebody had told her two years earlier about Jesus? Hey, let's don't wait. Hey, let's go now and tell them. They're all around us. And you know what? Yeah, bless God. That wicked crowd out there. Yeah, I know they're wicked just like we are. And if you're not careful, it's like, well, you know, reaping so they get what they deserve. No, no, we all deserve hell is what we deserve. Every one of us. Amen. We don't deserve to be in here tonight with our suit and tie on. We're not perfect. We're not holy. We're unholy, the Bible says. But the grace of God got to us. Amen. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Hey, I'm saved tonight, not because I'm good, but because he's good. And because when I was a little boy, he let the gospel come to where I was. He just happened to let me be born in a country where Bibles are everywhere. I didn't pick that. I didn't earn that. God saw fit to bring that to my life and he's brought it to your life. And the grace of God has gotten us to a place. We need to get out there and tell them. Amen. Hey, listen, there's not an issue they have that Jesus can't help them with it. Now, sometimes they look at us preachers and say, preacher, it can't be that easy. I mean, it can't always just be get right with God. And no, that's not always going to fix every issue you have. But I'm going to tell you something. That is the first step to the answer for every problem. Amen. And he knows the answer to every problem. We used to have a banner on our church and it said, Jesus is the answer to all your problems. I believe that. Hey, if I didn't believe that, I'd go find something else that I thought was the answer. But I'm here to tell you tonight, all the way from over on the other side of the country, that I believe Jesus can do anything in this world that you need. Yeah. Now, he don't have to do it, and he don't always do it the way we want him to. But listen, it's not because he can't. He can do anything. And we need to go tell him. And here's the part I really like about this story. Is that it was definitely a delayed decision, but it was a determined decision. I mean, she pressed through that crowd. She had to work hard to get there in that weakened state, but she was determined to get to Jesus. But it was a dependent decision. Look at verse 28. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, look at these words, I, what? Shall. shall be whole. I don't know, brother, I don't know if we, we don't do invitations in between or we do or whatever. I don't know what we're going to do. I'm almost done. If we do, we can have a piano player come, whatever you want to do. You know what I was impressed about right here? Here's this lady that we don't think she'd ever heard of Jesus till right before this. Somebody come to her and said, I know you've tried every doctor, but have you heard about Jesus? There's this man going around and he's healing people. And when she heard about Jesus, she came to him. But look at the faith in this text right here. She says, if I can touch his garment, I shall. She's completely convinced that Jesus is going to heal her. Where'd she get that? Where'd she get that faith? This is the part that strikes me right here. Whoever it was that told her about Jesus, they did a real good job. Whoever it was, because can you imagine, listen, 12 years, every physician, I mean, every friend you've got has told you somebody can help you. 
Every friend she's ever had has said, why don't you try this medicine, try this medicine and this doctor and this doctor. And every time she tried it, she got disappointed again. And so I don't know. Listen, I would think uh, that she would be like, well, it's worth a shot. Right. I've tried. Might as well. But look, that's not what she's saying here. This is not, well, it's worth a shot. I'll give this a try. And if it don't work, I'm No, that's not what she's saying. Whoever talked to her convinced her that Jesus can do this. This thing that nobody else could do for you, somebody convinced her Jesus can do it for you. And by the time they got done talking, in her heart, she knew he can do this for me that nobody else can do. I want to be that Christian. I want to be the one that no matter how bad their issues are, that no matter how long they've been in them, when I talk to them, I want to be the one that says with no doubt in my heart, Amen. I'm telling you, Jesus can help you. Amen. See, I want to be that Christian. I'm afraid many times that when I tell them, they can tell I don't know if he's going to do it. I'm afraid many times when we tell them, well, well, why don't you, well, why don't you try coming to church? Come on. Well, you know, well, You've tried everything else. It's worth a shot. Why don't you try Jesus? Hey, folks, listen. He's been better than that to me. He, is, he has never failed me in my life. I've failed him over and over, brother. And he has never failed me. And shame on me the way sometimes I give Jesus out. Almost like, well, you know, it's worth a try. Come on, give Jesus a try. Well, no wonder. No wonder they don't want to come and try. They can tell we don't even think he's going to do it. But whoever talked to this lady, I don't know if it was somebody else that had been healed. Maybe it was. Maybe it was a leper that's no longer a leper. And they had also tried everything. And then one day Jesus touched them. And maybe they started with tears in their eyes saying, Hey, look, I know you think it's hopeless, but let me tell you what he did for me. I was hopeless. I was a leper. I was an outcast. I had no hope. I was condemned. But one day Jesus came by and Jesus touched me. And look, and look, let me show you. Look, look, I've never been better. He did that for me and he's no respecter of persons and he'll do it for you. And she might have said, well, I'm not welcome. I'm not welcome. And then they could say, hey, I wasn't welcome. I had to walk around saying unclean, unclean. But he walked right up to us. Maybe it was that one of the ten. Right. And I hadn't read it, to be honest with you. I don't know where it's at. The scripture's right here. I don't know if I'm before or after. I'm just saying somebody before her believed that Jesus could fix her issue. And they believed it so good that when they told her, she left believing it. And she didn't come and say, I believe if I touch him, I might get healed. She came and said, if I can touch it, I shall be whole. And she did get it. And listen, we don't have these meetings just so we can all get in here and be warm and fuzzy with each other. We have these meetings to come in and get our issues dealt with so that then we can go out of here. And these cra Do you know we live in crazy days? Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. But you know what's the answer? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. You say, oh, it's too simple. Hey, it's no, it's not too simple. Sometimes we overcomplicate it. He is the answer. He fixed everything in my life. My dad was a drunk for 25 years. About 10 years ago, he got fixed. You know who fixed him? Jesus fixed him. Amen. And I need to believe that with such passion that when I'm telling somebody else he can help them, that they walk away thinking, I believe he could. 